in here. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm Brady from Nimblevis in the Volp firm. Welcome back to Get Your Tech On, our show on all things Doxis. This is episode 68. Our show today is going to be on plant powering. We have special guests here from Anersys, formerly called Alpha Technologies. Rob Anderson is Anderson, sorry about that, Rob, is Product Director, Product Management of Enersys, formerly Alpha Technologies. Rob, so glad to have you on the show today. Uh, Rob, where are you broadcasting from? I'm in uh, Bellingham, Washington. Outstanding, Rob. Also with us is John Downey, also Ron Burgundy of Cable, CMTS Technical Leader at Cisco Systems. John, good to have you back with us. I was gonna, I was gonna break out my uh, flute and play a little, uh, <laughs> little Jethro Tall for you. <laughs> good, good, good to have you back with us, John. Glad to have you and Rob with us on. Uh, so, our, for, our focus on the topic today is plant powering. Uh, Rob has rich expertise in this area. Before we get started, um, please do hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell. And if you like our content today, we'd love to give, have you give us a thumbs up. That helps with the algorithm. So, Rob, you have a lot of experience in plant powering. Um, and we talked beforehand, you know, I, I always refer to you guys as alpha. I think a lot of people in the industry refer to you as alpha, but you corrected me and says you're Enersys. I'd kind of like to start off there. Um, what do you know? So what is the difference between Enersys, your company name and alpha, how I think we all refer to you, your company as? Sure. Thanks, Brady. Yeah, I, I still refer to myself as alpha. <laughs> it's sort of, uh, you know, sometimes by accident. Um, so in late 2018, uh, Intersys purchased or acquired Alpha, <clears throat> along with a few other companies in the broadband industry. Um, so Alpha, as you, you may know, is a power uh, conversion company, power uh, solutions company, uh, broadband powering, uh, DC powering, AC UPS powering, that sort of thing. Intersys historically has been in the battery industry of uh, largest worldwide industrial battery manufacturer uh, out there. And so by bringing in the power conversion specialists uh, at Alpha, and then by bringing in some other um, specialized enclosures and uh, uh, cabinetry, um, other expertise areas, Intersys has really kind of uh, become a, a global, um, I say leader in power, all things power, power conversion uh, in a number across a number of different industries. And uh, as you mentioned, um, my background's in cable TV power, but uh, we span um, all sorts of different industries across uh, anything that needs power. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for the background there, because like I said myself, you guys are alpha to me, so I, no no offense if I continue to refer to you as alpha. Um, so and alpha the, is not going to alpha. Brady's not going away. The the products will always be branded alpha because that's what people recognize them as. Yeah, and that makes sense because I think you guys have a really really good legacy in the cable industry, as being known as the devices that power the cable plant. So kind of leading into that, um, I think you know we 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 kind of know or most people know that all the equipment. Uh, amplifiers, fiber nodes, that equipment needs some type of powering. But I, you know, not everyone knows exactly what it means when we say they get powered. You know, did they get powered off of 110 volt AC? Or, you know, what is what does that powering mean? So if, if you can just give us a, a quick overview, what is plant powering and what do the alpha power supplies do? Sure. <clears throat> so as you mentioned, any active device on a, on a network, the HFC network um, in particular needs power. So amplifiers, optical nodes, um, uh, there's a number of elements that um, require power. Um, what the broadband UPS or the alpha power supply does <clears throat> is it supplies power to those active elements. And it does so in somewhat of a unique way. Um, power comes into our unit from the AC utility grid, either 110 or 240 volt. We're typically located outdoors on a, on a pole or in a pedestal on the ground somewhere. And then that power is um, transmitted over the coax cable along with the RF signal. So it's multiplexed, if you will, on the coax with the, with the RF. It's typically, it's 90 volts AC. Um, in the past, it's been lower voltages, 60 volts AC. And even lower voltages were around... Um, uh, 20, 30 years ago, but pretty much everything now is, is 90 volts AC. 
uh, coming out of the power supply. And that uh, powers uh, all the active devices through the network. So you're saying 90 volts. Why not? Why, why aren't we running 110 or even 220? Because I, I would think with higher voltages, we could power more devices. You certainly could. You'd have longer reach as well because you wouldn't have the resistance losses over the over the cable, so you'd be able to extend that voltage out longer. The reason 90 volts um, is used is that there are regulatory um, safety reasons why 90 volts is a considered a, a safer voltage, uh, and as nine with 90 volts, the cable operators are able to use their own technicians to work on the plant, work on the, the components and, and the powering systems. Anything above 90 volts, they'd be required to use a licensed electrician to work on the line. It would be considered utility voltage. And you can, you can actually see that separation on a pole where you'll have the space on the pole that has the, the communications gear. And then several feet above that is the utility power. Um, space. And so uh, all of our gear is located in that communication space uh, with that 90 volt limit. Okay. So I was always, I was always under the, the uh, impression that uh, you needed an electric license for 90, 90 volts and above. So anytime you measured a 90 volt HFC plant powering, it was actually less than 90. It might have been 88, 87. But if you did a 60 volt plant, it would always be higher. <laughs> I would always measure like 63, <laughs> 64, because more is a little bit more is better. Uh, but yeah, in the case of 90 volt, was always a little bit less because I think of that uh, regulatory concern. And that's right. technically accurate, John. We're not really 90 volts. That's just generic. We're 89 point something volts. And the closer you can get to 90, the the better off you are as far as the reach on the coax. And the other big one would be it's not a true sine wave, right? Right, quasi square. I, I used to call. I used to mess people up by saying it's quasi sine wave. <laughs> it's quasi square or it's quasi sine. It's quasi something, quasi moto. <laughs> but a lot of people would measure with a voltmeter that wasn't true RMS and get the wrong wrong readings anyway, not knowing that this is not a peak sine wave. It's a quasi square wave, and uh, so you need a true RMS meter to get the real voltage. Yes, what, you do. Yeah. So, so what is the reason that we, we don't have a true sine wave coming out of the power supplies? Why do we have that quasi kind of a square shaped wave coming out? It has to do with the design of the UPS. Um, to understand the quasi square wave, and we also call it trapezoidal wave, just to throw in another term to confuse people. Uh, but the, this trapezoidal wave or quasi square wave is what you get on the output of something called a ferroresonant transformer. So we use a, a special type of transformer circuit. It's a transformer capacitor tank circuit that is used in these outdoor UPSs. And they're used for a number of reasons. Um, one very primary reason is line isolation. If you have a surge on the input of one of these ferroresonant transformers, you have a thousand to one isolation between the input and the output. So a thousand volt surge coming in, say from a lightning strike perhaps that hit several poles down, that surge is gonna come through the utility line. It's gonna hit the input of the UPS power supply. That thousand volts coming in is gonna to translate to only one volt on the output. So it has great isolation for uh, protection against surges, lightning, that sort of thing, which is very common in the outdoor environment. Uh, the other reason is that it has a characteristic um, which is desirable in, in HFC networks called foldback. And what that means is that the, 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 the ferroresonant tank circuit, basically the capacitor and the, and the transformer, have energy constantly floating around inside of them. As you add load to the output of your power supply, that energy starts to deplete. And, and actually changes the, way, the shape of, the, of that quasi-square wave. So it starts to become a little more sinusoidal looking with more load that you put on it because you're consuming more energy from, the, from that circuit, that tank circuit. So what happens if you have a short circuit on the output? Um, if you have a short circuit on the output, that tank circuit will do something called fold back. It'll essentially drop the voltage down to zero and it'll stay at zero until the short circuit's removed. That eliminates any need for fuses or circuit breakers or damaged equipment. The, the equipment is essentially self-healing. 
as soon as this, the short circuit on the output goes away, the voltage comes back and then the network power returns. Is, is there is there a, a typical, would you say a fallback current or voltage? I think you would say current, right? Fallback current? Current, yeah. 20 amp supply at 25 amps it folds back? Is there a typical percentage or a number? You're gonna fold back at around 200%. So if, uh, just round numbers, if it's a 20 amp power supply, then 40 amps, you're, you're definitely gonna be fold, folding back. A little before that, but that's that's kind of a round number. These power supplies will typically operate at 150% capacity for extended periods of time if needed. We don't recommend it obviously, but um, if it's needed, they, they can operate. Uh, well over their rated capacity. And you might blow out uh, an RF choke in the, one of the first passes off the amp, off the power supply before the power supply blows, right? Exactly. <laughs> We're hoping you use circuit breakers and things like that to help you know control that before you blow anything up. But it's good to know the fallback current is kind of like a catch-all, right? It is, yeah. I'm just going to burn up. Yeah. So, so one of our, you know, we're, we're talking about burning things up and stuff. Um, one of our, our common chat room fellows has a uh, throwaway account is his name has joined us. And he says 90 volts, 10 amps running through a coax, uh, cable. Um, and then he has like a, a skull and crossbones and a coffin beside us. So I think that's a, a common question that comes up. And we also hear from subscribers as well is, you know, do we have that 90 volts running into subscribers homes? And then also is that 90 volts at 10 amps? Is that dangerous to, to people? Well, that's two, two questions. Let me, let me address the, I got five side. more coming after that. Don't worry. Okay. No worries. Just throw them all out. <laughs> So no, the coax that comes into your home does not have any voltage on it at all, only the RF signal. Uh, there are things called uh, power blocking and power passing taps. Um, and there'll be a power blocking tap somewhere north of or upstream from the individual home. Remember the purpose of the power is to power amplifiers and, and nodes. Um, once you get right down to the drop cable going into the home, you're, you're past all the actives, so there's no need to propagate that voltage down the coax. So the voltage is, is um, blocked before it gets to your home. That's the, that's the first question. And the second question is, of course, it's dangerous. Voltage of any level can be lethal. Um, and obviously, you have to take, take precautions uh, with, with using you know, any, any electrical equipment. Uh, and the, the the line techs who work on this gear are trained to to you know drop outputs, disconnect things, hit circuit breakers, that sort of thing before they actually work on the gear. Okay, makes sense, Rob. Um, so, Rob, any you know before we move on to the next topic, um, any any recommendations that you guys generally make for people as far as like you know trying to. Uh, keep their equipment from getting shorts, maybe things like fuses versus um, shunts in power supplies. Uh, any other general recommendations that you would make? Well, you know, every cable operator has their own way of doing things. And uh, that would be an awfully interesting question to ask several of the cable operators. Is how do you architect your power network inside your HFC plant? Because you're going to, for 10 different operators, you'll get 12 different answers. So I don't quite know that there's one answer to that question other than we, we try to make the equipment as safe as possible and self-protecting so that if somebody does something um, that they're not supposed to, that uh, you don't blow up uh, the equipment along the way. Okay. Yeah, I would, I, I did, uh, when I, when Brady and I worked at uh, Secor, <laughs> that's a throwback to Mia. Um, <laughs> I did a paper, one of my first papers for SCTE. This is 15, no, 25 years ago, whatever it was. And it was on uh, grounding, bonding, surge, surge suppression, um, and, uh, and fusing. And a lot of systems at the time were getting rid of their fuses and their amplifiers because it just creates havoc on troubleshooting. You don't know which one blew. People are putting a generic value in, and you know not the same current's not flowing at every location. So you can't really customize the fuse for every location either so it becomes very difficult and it's like why don't we just shunt the whole trunk line and put a surge suppression device and then maybe one fuse at the power inserter and that's it then if it blows we know exactly where it is the question would be is if we run all the numbers and it does have a short is that fuse the proper value uh is it a slow blow fuse versus a fast blow fuse there is a difference 
Uh, so there was a lot of like gotchas there and not just that, but what about grounding? You know, are you common bonded? Are you grounded? How are you grounded? Um, so there was, a, yeah, a lot of information, like you said, and, and different ways of looking at that. Um, I always like to keep it simple. But on top of that, I know Brady will remember this. When AT&T wanted to get into telecommunications, we, we did the 1996 Telecommunications Act, I think. And AT&T is like, oh, I'm going to buy up AT&T or TCI. And they started getting into it before Comcast bought it back or whatever. Um, they wanted Secor to make a 90 volt, one hertz power mm -hmm. supply. The you, problem you, with that is that's the same it really did your hurt. <laughs> yeah, that's the same rate as your heart. So if you grabbed it and you know you stopped your heart, I used to joke I would just dis disconnect it and start people back up with a defibrillator. You know, <laughs> just grab the two ends of the the coaxer <laughs> and start it back up. But yeah, that didn't very go very far. So the question there would be, why not just do DC? I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you, why do we even do AC? Why do we do 60 hertz, 60 you know, cycles per second? Interesting question. There's a lot of reasoning behind it, and there's also a lot of sort of, uh, I would say, religion behind it, what folks believe in and what they've always done, and, and they're not going to change what they've done. But I mean, the, the telco industry has done... 96 volt DC for years, right? So, and they're they're stepping it up to do higher DC voltages um, for longer runs. Uh, there's nothing wrong with DC. DC is very viable. Um, you do have one element of DC, which is um, a galvanic corrosion type of a effect, where if current is running through a cable in one direction for long periods of time, you'll start to get corrosion in the cable, and you can eliminate that effect by alternating. So that, that one hertz idea that you mentioned from way back in the 90s wasn't such a bad idea, although um, in, in, in theory anyway, um, but um, so much of the cable legacy and history has been around AC type of, of equipment that uh, it, would be a, it would be a big stretch to try to get everybody to sort of change their mentality. Not that it's it's not necessarily doable or that there might be reasons in the future with new architectures coming out that a, uh, DC might make sense. But uh, there's a lot of AC cable network in the world today. And uh, I think it's going to be around for quite a while. Yeah, that was my understanding too, is the uh, corrosion aspect. DC safety wise, uh, your, your muscles contract when you grab DC. So, so if people grab DC, they can't let go because their muscles are contracting. Uh, AC will throw you away. So it could be a safety issue, but the, the corrosion was my concern. I always heard that the DC could create more corrosion. We have enough problems with column path distortion and corrosion of dissimilar metal contacts and stuff like that. The other thing I wanted to bring up was, and, and Brady you probably remember this as well, the quasi square wave, because we do full wave rectification in the amplifiers, it's easier to take a quasi square wave with flat top and bottom to make it look flat across the whole thing to turn it into DC. Then you don't have to clean up as much in between the little dips where you did the full wave uh, rectification or full wave, uh, whatever we call it. Um, so I found that quasi square wave is probably just easier to convert to DC that the amplifiers need. And one of the test points, and you probably know the answer to this too, I thought it was, it's good trivia. The test point was called B plus. What yep. did that B plus stand for? I don't recall, but I do recall the test point being like a relative test point. It's like it was 24 volt plus or minus. Like you always look to see if there's any AC running on a DC test point. Mm -hmm. They would call it ripple and it would cause home and stuff like that. But later on, I found out it was just meant battery. Battery. Yeah. Plus meant battery. And I'm like, ah, that's a little bit of trivia for you. <laughs> yep. All right. So uh, Jason Roop has entered the chat room. His, uh, I'll go to his fe for a second. 90 volts times 10 amps equals 900. What's the problem? Jason has a very dry sense of humor. But we still we still let him in anyhow. Um, but he does uh, ask a good question, which leads us into our next segment. Does, can PNM be used to detect power leakage into the coax system? So, Rob, you have um, you guys have cable modems 
built into your power supplies, right? And and um, I, I think I'd like to ask you, I, I have some ideas of the coolness of why these cable modems in, are in there. I think they can kind of answer some of Jason's questions, but I'll let you elaborate on everything your cable modems do in the power supplies. Sure. Well, just so we'll kind of level the field for any listeners who may not be familiar with, why would you put a cable modem in a power supply? Let me back up uh, about... 25 years and go back to um, the original days of DOCSIS in the late 90s, DOCSIS 1.0, um, we were actually putting proprietary RF modems called transponders in the power supplies. They had fixed up, up, uplink and downlink frequencies. And uh, the purpose of them was to provide telemetry of, from the power supply back to some sort of network operations center. Um, and we still do that today. That's the primary reason for putting a DOCSIS modem today in a power supply is to provide telemetry and alarm information to the cable operator. So an example of why you might need that is the, the, the UPS is designed to back up the network. Uh, if there's a utility power outage and the UPS runs on batteries, does what it's supposed to do, that's great. But if that utility outage is extended, eventually you're going to deplete the batteries. They're going to, they're going to um, use, you're going to use all the energy in the batteries. You're going to drop the load and the network's going to go down. We'll send alarms and notifications prior to that, uh, prior to the battery depleting so that the operators have time to take action if they want to. Roll a truck with a technician and a portable generator, for example, to back up that site so that the network remains stable, even during extended outages, say during storms, that sort of thing. So that's the reason why you even have a DOCSIS modem in a power supply. Now, the kind of the cool factor you mentioned, Brady, is, yeah, because it's a DOCSIS modem, it has everything DOCSIS related in it. So you've got all the PNM type features that are standard with DOCSIS built in. Um, you can do full band capture to look at um, the spectrum at the physical location in the network where the power supply is located. Um, you can do um, um, any kind of spectral analysis that you can do in a, in a home cable modem, um, you can do in that, in that modem, uh, in the power supply. <clears throat> it gives you a really unique opportunity to perhaps triangulate information. You know what the signal looks like in, in a home cable modem, you know that the power supply is physically at a different location in the network. If you're seeing signal that is different between location A and location B, it might, you might be able to use that difference and the relative location of the two to hone in on particular problems or to find lo the location of a particular issue in the network. Okay. So I love I love what you're talking about because we you know we use cable modems today to do a lot of analysis in PNM in the plant and you're basically saying that cable modem if it's in a power supply these power supplies are throughout the network we can use that same thing I I, I want to drill back into uh, Jason's specific question because I think it, it's kind of unique he's saying we're we're looking for power leakage um, so what kind of capabilities that are actually going beyond PNM. Uh, that mm -hmm. we can we currently do today, uh, are we able to see maybe segments of the plant that would have excessive power draw or that would have, you know, just kind of monitoring that type of thing? So now we can start to look for things where um, maybe a power supply is being overused, maybe, and that would help us identify that a uh, a an amplifier is starting to use or, or an, a fiber node is starting to consume more power than it should be. Can, you, can we start to get that type of insight into the plant that maybe use that information from a proactive standpoint to monitor power consumption? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we do some of that today. So, so here's an example that I think relates to, to the question specifically. Um, we had a situation, it was last summer, where uh, an operator was mentioning that they were having some issues uh, with a, uh, uh, an amplifier. Um, uh, they thought it was an amplifier, they weren't quite sure. And we were able to look at the power history, um, the output current on a particular leg of the power supply. And we saw that over a period of time, the output power had risen. They hadn't added, they hadn't added any network to the, to the or any, any uh, new segments to that particular part of the network. And uh, so something had changed over a period of about six months and they were able to use that information along with some, some other data that 
indicated that the lasers uh, were going out, uh, excuse me, it was a node, not an amplifier, that there was something wrong with the lasers in the amplifier and they were starting to, to, to die off. Um, and it was simply a matter of looking at a change in current over time. So we could certainly do that. I mean, you know that the network should be drawing a certain amount of current. There's gonna be some amount of breathing in the plant, but that can be accounted for. Uh, and then beyond that, you can actually set alarms to trigger you if, say, output current changes. Uh, you can do the same thing with uh, input voltage. If you're seeing strange anomalies on the, on the utility, you may have something going on in your utility input um, in a particular area, and you can look at the utility input data. Maybe the, the AC power dips or frequency shifts uh, every day at uh, four in the afternoon uh, at three power supplies that are generally located in the same vicinity. We saw that once, it happened to be near an aluminum smelter and the, uh, the power supplies were seeing the results of some large equipment in the, in the smelter being switched or, or transitioning from one state to another. And so, yeah, you can certainly use that telemetry from a power supply to give you all kinds of information beyond just how the power supply is running. Okay, so that's I, I want to unpack this a little bit because this is some cool information. So not only if I if I understand you correctly, you're not only able to see fluctuations of power changes that are being consumed by the cable network, amplifiers, fiber nodes, stuff like that, but you're are you also saying that you're able to see fluctuations and changes by the mainline power network? We are yes. So we measure everything coming in and everything going out of the UPS. So we'll look at, um, we'll look at um, power, we'll look at voltage, we'll look at current, we'll look at power voltage and current in and power and voltage and current out. Um, we actually use kind of the, a similar concept to full band capture, but on a, with less resolution, we essentially have a little spectrum analyzer that looks at the AC input uh, and can analyze any anomalies on the AC power. So if something weird comes up, phase shift or funky dips in the power or brownout type situations, we can look at that and then we can flag that, send an alarm and let the operators know, hey, something, something funny is going on here at this location. Yeah, no, that's very cool. And it puts you in a unique position for operators to be able to monitor, as you say, both what's coming in and what's going out throughout the network. Um, so do you see that the operators are taking advantage of that and using you as a maybe a power supply, empowering monitoring a uh, asset within their networks? You know, I see that they're starting to do that. Um, there's so many tools out there, and honestly, not a lot of operators are using them to their full extent. And I'm not just talking about the tools in our power supply, but in general, I, we could kind of talk, have the same discussion about P&M. How many operators are really using it to its full extent and, and capability. Um, probably a few of them, but I bet others could, could have room to improve. Same thing with the, the power uh, supply capabilities. Um, if What we typically see today is if there's an issue, if there's a, a problem somewhere in the network uh, and they start digging into it and they see that the power supply is somehow you know, on the receiving end of that issue or, or looks like it may be contributing to that issue, they'll they'll call us up and ask and that's when we have a chance to kind of dig in a little bit more and look at the the, the issues and and provide some of that some of that information i'm starting to see operators use it a little more proactively but i think there's still some room for for more of that in the future very cool and and so now you ha so you do have this cable modem in there we talked about it just from more of a telemetry standpoint but it's still a high speed cable modem you can do mm -hmm. A gigabit per second, right? What what other capabilities are you able to do with this cable modem when they're distributed throughout the network? So a couple of things. You know, we had a we had a, an operator approach us. Uh, it was 2013. They they came to us and had an interesting problem. They said, "Hey, I can't get Wi-Fi access um, when I'm in the inner. It was an inner city um, area. I can't get Wi-Fi access." Uh, in this particular area, uh, and I looked up, and there was one of my alpha power supplies on a pole. Why can't I put a wireless access point up there and use that real estate I already own as a as a hotspot? And so we explored that idea a little bit, 
more and we it kind of opened the door to a number of applications. Um, we do have some 4G LTE type gear co-located with some of our power supplies around the world. Um, that's been an interesting application. Um, we have locations where there are surveillance cameras co-located with power supplies and using the modem as backhaul for that data. Uh, but what we found in general was where you want to put your device, whether it's a, a LTE radio, a Wi-Fi app access point, a security surveillance camera, where you want to locate that may not necessarily be where a power supply is located. So we developed a, a, something we're calling a gateway product, which is essentially a modem and a power conversion element inside of a little strand mount box that allows you to connect um, any of those type of elements up to your uh, coax plant for powering the device and for backhauling data from the device. Uh, we're seeing big applications for that for um, uh, wireless, particularly as uh, CBRS and upcoming 5G type of small cells are, are starting to be discussed and, and deployed over the next few years. We, we think that kind of application is really gonna take off. Interesting. Um, and la last thing on this, because you, you mentioned CBRS and uh, and 5G kind of all at the same time. And what is, in, is CBRS the same as 5G? Because we get a lot of questions on that. Sure. Well, and, and of course, I'm looking at it from a power, through a powering and backhaul lens. So I'm certainly not the expert. But what we see is that you know, CBRS is basically the 3.5 gigahertz band. We had recent auctions and cable operators spent over a billion dollars on spectrum to be able to use that band. So you know they're gonna do something with it. Um, 5G is a, is a series of fifth generation uh, wireless specifications. And it's gone through a number of releases. We're in release 16 now that came out in July, I believe. Not, again, not the expert, I think it was July. Um, that release, uh, when we start seeing equipment deployed for that is going to encompass a lot of the 5G promise that we've started to, to hear about, the ultra low latency, high reliability, the massive machine type communications type stuff where you're really going to need lots of radios located throughout a community to be able to service some of those mid-band and millimeter wave type of applications where you need that, the bands for that kind of speed. So CBRS being at 3.5 gigahertz is a band that allows very high speed communications and the cable operators now have access to that. So I would consider CBRS as being a, kind of a subset of what the full 5G umbrella would encompass. Cool. Thanks for that. Thanks for the overview. Um, so I want to move into the next section now, which is called distributed oh. access architecture and powering. Oh, hey. sorry, John. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> I'm Go still ahead. here. I'm still here. <laughs> you just can't get rid of me. Um, so I was thinking about uh, when we had Larry Walcott on talking about water and coax and using full bandwidth capture and high end roll off and and uh, the, how the standing waves look really crazy when you had water in the drop line, but what happens when you have water in the hard line? So Rob, that would be like a high resistive fault to ground, right? If I had water in my hard line and I have AC on the center conductor and water is a high resistive conduction, if you will, maybe it's a little bit of salt in there from the aluminum uh, and it's going to my sheath. So it's going to ground. It's a short circuit, but it's a high resistive short circuit. So I could see where monitoring the power supply and seeing it go from say 15 amps to 18 amps, it actually could be water. It could be amplifiers, um, but knowing the history of the power supply current draw and seeing it fluctuate like that, you might be able to correlate that with, oh yeah, it just rained yesterday. Oh uh, yeah, it rained for like three days straight. And maybe I do have a leak and I'm, I'm drawing more current because I, I have real high resistive short to ground. I mean, have you seen stuff like that before? I mean, does it make sense? Yeah, hey, you know, it makes total sense, John. Have we specifically seen it before? I can't honestly say that I've had that particular application or issue come up where we've identified it as such, but you could definitely see how using the 
current history, the output current draw history with the power supply could would be a great tool for for that because you're going to draw more current. You mentioned it. Um, you know, as as you get freezing nights, the moisture freezes inside. You're going to get that sort of. Uh, it's going to change the resistance. Anything that changes the resistance in the cable causes the current to fluctuate in any way is going to show up. You're going to be able to use that information, uh, hopefully, to pin down where the problem's located. All right. Thanks. And then to uh, Jason uh, Brady, power is not just I times V. In an AC circuit, Eli the Iceman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Remember Eli the Iceman? Yeah. Conductive circuit, you talk about voltage and current in a capacitive circuit. So current waveform and voltage waveform don't follow each other perfectly. It's not a DC circuit, so you have a power factor. So power equals I times V times power factor. <laughs> so what's do that the, extra one What's in there. the problem, I think, was it? <laughs> what's the problem? What's, what's the problem? problem? <laughs> or, or VA is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> VA. So... All right, moving into DAA. So uh, we we ha my neighborhood was upgraded a couple of years ago to Node Plus Zero, and they got the nodes installed, but they had some issues with powering. And we, for a while, we had hardline coax running through sidewalks across roads in order to power the nodes that they had put in because they didn't have sufficient power supplies. It was not optimally are architected. And so um, I think, Rob, you know, we kind of want to talk about what, uh, have we had lessons learned? What are best practices now when we go from a, a system that has been a traditional node with multiple amplifiers to now something that is a node plus zero, or maybe even node plus one, where it's no longer that traditional network. And now, you know, what do they do? Do they put a power supply at every node? What 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 have been the creative lessons in order to start powering nodes when there's not a a traditional uh, cascade as what we've had in the past? Right. Well, it, it's an interesting question, Brady, because it's so multifaceted. There's there's really a few things we're dealing with here when you go to a DAA node, and by DAA node, um, what we've seen so far are our fine nodes, remote fine nodes. I haven't seen any deployments yet of remote Mac 5 type devices. I expect they'll be similar, but perhaps with a little more current draw. Um, but so DAA nodes in general though, um, i.e. RFI nodes today, um, we're seeing a couple of different things. One thing is they draw more power than their analog counterparts. Uh, we would see maybe 80, 90 watts power required out of an analog optical node. Uh, we've seen 150 to 170 watts required out of some uh, RFI nodes, DAA nodes. So there's more power required at a particular location. That's one difference. The second difference is um, if you've got your, your uh, RFI node sitting there um, in a location where an amplifier used to be, so you're going fiber deeper, let's say, and there used to be an amplifier there. Now there's an RFI node. It's being fed by it's fed by uh, fiber, obviously, because it's a it's a fiber node. Um, how do you power the thing? Do you like you said? Do you you had some coax running across your streets and that sort of thing. Um, how do you power something that used to be powered over the coax, but you no longer need to have coax as the input to that device? Um, what we've seen a couple operators do is simply, I'm going to say simply, there's not too much simple about it, but uh, they, as a first line of attack, they will use the existing coax basically as power extension cables. So they'll, they'll take existing UPS power supply locations, and if there was coax there powering optical amplifiers, excuse me, not optical, but RF amplifiers, and now they're powering optical nodes, if that coax is in the right place or even nearby, they will uh, use the coax as their basically powering cable or power extension cable. Um, when there is no coax available, uh, we've seen uh, operators run short extensions of coax. We've also seen them need to upgrade their power supply because I, as I mentioned, um, the, the DAA nodes take more power than their old analog counterparts. So, uh, we've seen upgrades where they may have been using, say, 10 or 11 amps in a particular power power segment of the network. Now they're upwards of 15 or 16 amps, so they're perhaps upgrading their power supply to the next size up to 
to support the capacity. Did we lose him? Uh, maybe just temporarily. Um, hopefully we'll get him back. So, John, um, I know we were talking beforehand. You had talked about um, some powering issues that occurred. <laughs> oh, Rob, you came back. We lost wow, you for a moment happened. there. <laughs> I don't know. You, you just dropped out. Um, you were... You, go ahead and pick up where you left off. <laughs> what, what was the last thing you heard, Brady? Because I rambled on for a while. Um you talking about the uh, back back feeding the power on the coax, and yeah. you know the fact that you might be replacing an amplifier that might only be fifty watts or whatever with a hundred and sixty watt node. So yeah, there's a lot more. The last thing you mentioned was you might have a power supply that you were at eleven amps, and now you're up to fourteen, fifteen amps. So you might have to upgrade to a, a twenty amp supply because yeah. um, there's a lot of thought when this first started coming out with DAA, would I be required or would it be in my best interest to put smaller power supplies in everywhere? More is not always better, right? Right. <laughs> always this, uh, and you'd say religion for that as well, for powering is, should I have a centralized location that could provide further away? Remember back in the day when Com Comscope came out with PF625 cable? It was called 625, the center conductor was huge. It was 30 ohm cable. It was just for power. For powering, yep. Yeah, it was just for power. I thought that was an interesting idea, but it was that centralized idea. Have a centralized power supply, maybe even with a diesel generator backup, it was huge. And then centrally power up nodes far away. Yeah. Um, so are we, are we going down that same path again? Uh, Is one big power of... supply better than a bunch of small power supplies? Yeah, yeah. Imagine in in general. You know, in general, I think the answer is yes. And that's because it's expensive and it's timely. It's most expensive from a cost and a time standpoint to install new power supplies. You gotta have pull permits and you've gotta pay for pull access and, and that sort of thing. If you can get by with just upgrading an existing location or by maybe strapping power from a nearby location to power uh, node segments, uh, new node segments from underutilized power supplies that may be nearby. We've seen operators do both of that. They'll, they'll one, upgrade their existing power supply if they can. Uh, two, they will perhaps reroute some coax uh, with power passing elements to be able to maybe get power to a new node from an adjacent area that has a, a power supply with some spare power. And only as a last resort will they put new power supplies in because of the expense and time associated with with adding new equipment like that. So I mean, I think the big the big takeaway from this is any operator that's not started to run DAA or put in any type of remote five nodes is they really have to think about the powering and make sure that they are running, as you're saying, running dedicated lines to those nodes. And ideally, your recommendation is have one centralized powering for an area, maybe it's like a neighborhood or something like that, if they're putting those powers, those uh, remote phi nodes in? Well, I, I don't know if there's any ideal recommendation. It's gonna be so dependent on the network architecture that exists and what they're, what they're coming from and what they're going to. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be powering other things in the future that they're gonna to have to consider. We, we talk about DAA nodes today, um, and today they're, they're basically R phi nodes, uh, there are movements, uh, there's, a, there's an SCTE gap committee defining a generic access platform node housing, and there's talk about putting other things in that housing. You may have an EPON service area coming out of that same housing. You Did may have a, the power for that thing. Was it 200 watts? Was yeah, I think it was 200, watt, 200 watts, yeah. But that's going to get eaten up pretty quick if now you're going to put maybe an EPON segment or perhaps an edge compute device or some sort of wireless device. Um, those are some of the ideas that have been tossed around. And obviously, you're going to eat your power up pretty quickly if you add new, new elements to the network. Yeah, and there's been more and more discussion of edge compute. Um, so, so we can do more processing at the fiber node and more analysis at the fiber node as we, as we talk things about, you know, PNM applications, things that we can do analysis quicker and make decisions, find impairments quicker. So I, I can see how that power is going to keep going up and up. When we talk about MACFI, 
we're going to see more powering at the node. Um, so that becomes more of a crucial issue there. Um, John, you had mentioned earlier when we were sort of in the pre-show, we were... Yeah. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Okay. Hold that thought. So I think, Rob, you'll appreciate this as well. Understanding voltage drop, DC loop resistance. If I locate that 200-watt device farther away from the power supply, that voltage and current makes a bigger voltage drop. Lower voltage to my device draws more current. It's like a, a round robin snowball out of effect, uh, you know, so it, so it settles down. So it's almost in our best interest that anything that draws more current should be as close as possible to a power supply. I'm not going to be able to do it everywhere, but then we, if we can't make it close, that's why that power feeder cable came out, less voltage drop. So yeah, I could see that being a, a, a big concern, um, having to power up these devices farther away and utilize existing coax and no choice unless I do have the capability to redistribute power or put in another power supply. But like you said, there's a lot of red tape to put in more power supplies. And then battery backup. And I had a question for you is, are you seeing battery backup with solar recharging at all? Is that popular? No, not yet. You know, the panels would have to be so large and, and cumbersome today um, for to be effective that it just hasn't really caught on yet. We're, yeah. we're as part of Interest, we're looking into to solar, and we do a lot of solar applications, but not yet for broadband uh, battery charging or backup. And, and the batteries, and I, I thought this was interesting too. The batteries were meant for steady state current. They're not like car batteries that are meant for quick surge current, correct? Right, right. So Different chemistry inside. Your batteries for their car. <laughs> yeah. All right. So back to you, Brady, on the topic. My thought, my anger. thought is, is going back to power and surges, John. And, and so I, I think you had a good comment where you're talking about when people don't use power and surges, and I, I'd like you to elaborate maybe on that again. So I had a case one time where I had ingress coming in. I didn't realize it was ingress, but the, the signal on my plant was a, a qualm carrier, upstream qualm carrier that uh, was replicated. And basically it was a heterodyning of an ingress signal with the original signal causing artifacts. And um, most people don't look below five megahertz on a spectrum analyzer, but this was below five megahertz. Turned out it was AM radio at 1500 AM. You know, that's, you know, 1.5 megahertz and that spike mixing with a 24 megahertz carrier would create a 24 megahertz plus or minus 1.5 and it turned out that the am radio was getting in through the power supply going through a power insertion port on the node the moral of the story there was if you design your node with a power inserter on an rf port you'd have extra isolation so some of these power insertion ports on nodes might not have as much RF choking as you would like. So there's an RF choke there to choke RF, but below five megahertz, that frequency might still get through. And it did, and it bled over onto my plant, caused laser clipping, which created my artifact. So that was a concern and the easy fix was just make sure I use a power inserter. Because now not only do I have RF choke in a power inserter, then I have the diplex filter and everything else on the RF port. Um, so I thought that was interesting. The other one was originally when uh, power supply monitors, DOCSIS uh, tell, tells, um, what is it called? Transponders. Uh, transponders, thank you. Uh, were in the power nodes. Some people would say, all right, here's a node with an RF port that I'm not using. And they would try to take that RF port and put a, an F to RG11 connector or something like that and run it right to the, the modem. I'm like, that's not good to do. Said, there's no real loss there. Your downstream levels are screaming. Your upstream levels, even though the modem can come online at like 25 dBmV, that's not something you should allow to happen. You should try to get a modem to be like a typical house modem and be transmitting in the upstream around 45 to 48 dBmV. Uh, if you don't knock down the downstream levels, you have distortions in the modems. If you allow the modem to transmit at say 35 dBmV, if something happens in a node where it has to range again, it could range to 60 dBmV or 55 and overdrive everybody else. So 
I always say, you know, make sure that a, a modem, whether in a head end or power supply, uh, has proper padding upstream and downstream. So it's receiving downstream between plus and minus five and upstream around 45 dBmV transmit, and we'd be much better off. So to the, to the uh, power inserter question, Rob, what I, what I had, uh, my thought for this was, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of equipment that you can directly power insert your, your um, power supply into. But I think John makes a really good point. That some of that equipment is not optimally designed, but power inserters are. Um, Rob, would you would your recommendation? And, and I don't know if you have an experience with this, but would you always say always put a power inserter when you're inserting power into an active device like an amplifier, fire, fiber node, or um, you know what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, for the exact reasons John mentioned for the for the isolation, um, the filtering, I would definitely recommend that. Now. You and John um, have some RF background. I'm more of a digital guy gone into the world of power. So I can't give you all the reasons why it's a good idea. But um, from just from experience, I can tell you that John's absolutely right. You, you want to use a power inserter. You want to use the proper filtering to, uh, uh, to input to any, any RF device like that. Okay. And I think you and I talked earlier about the transponders and the power supplies and most times a node has a tap off of it feeding customers. So hopefully there's an empty tap port that you could just right. use for your transponder and the power supply, correct? That's exactly what most people do, yeah. Yeah, and even if there wasn't customers, I've seen MSOs and cable companies install a tap in that location just for those purposes, for a transponder, for a test point, for future, you know, you don't know what might come along in the future. Maybe you want to put a, a 5G, uh, microcell or, or whatever, uh, a hotspot, and maybe it just makes sense to have a, a tap at that location right off the node. Usually that might be a 23 tap. Maybe I'm looking more towards the, uh, I don't know if you've seen the taps now that have cable simulation or equalization in them. They're called yeah. uh, flexible solution taps. So it's not a flat loss tap. It, I could design whatever I really want on that tap. All right. So we have one question here. Uh, this kind of a generic question from Grant Logan in the chat room. He says, off the wall, have you witnessed abandonment of coax in sparsely populated areas? Do you think that there's any hope of these networks being switched back on with fiber deep initiatives underway? I kind of have my own thoughts on this. That I, I think a lot of those networks were gone away. Um, Rob, I hand this off to you first because I am curious if you've seen this with, you know, like power supplies being abandoned in these networks where we've just plowed through and gone fiber deep and deployed fiber. You think these networks are going to get reutilized? Are you guys pulling these power supplies back out and seeing them being redistributed? Thoughts on this? You know, I, I honestly can't say that I've seen this specific instance, so I, I can't add too much to the question. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. John, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to envision how that would happen. Um, so so it's, try to bubble it down for, boil it down for me. Um, we're talking about um, a place where we run fiber deeper and maybe we do our fog or fiber to the home, but there's an existing coax plant there. I'm, 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 a, I'm questioning. Yeah, I mean, I, I know it, even in my neighborhood, when they ran Node Plus Zero, there's there's amplifiers sitting around still in pedestals. They're just dead. There's nothing running to them. So I, I don't know if that's kind of what he's focused on there. But I, I can see areas where, you know, you, you are going to, when you start pushing fiber deeper, you're going to have air, sections of the plant that are just no longer used anymore. Now, I don't know if he's we, talking about places where you're just blowing fiber past it. But yeah, there's definitely there's definitely equipment that gets left that's, behind. That's part of the thing we want to exploit for powering, right? I mean, if there is coax there, then we can still use it for powering these other devices, hopefully. Um, but yeah, you, I, I think you know, it just if you leave it there, someone will pull it out and sell it for the raw materials. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it gets sold in another country. So. <laughs> so, gentlemen, we are running at the top of the hour here. Like, give you an opportunity. Um, John, to plug anything coming up, any any new products, anything like that? Um, I don't think there's any conferences or anything coming up lately. Um, 
the I I think I'll address the elephant in a room since you will, but uh, I thought it was interesting that Cable Labs is uh, in an agreement to acquire SCTE, and I think it, it could be very complimentary. Uh, so I think it'll be interesting to see where that goes with conferences, things coming up, because doesn't Cable Labs have a, a forefront conference coming up soon? Well, they just yeah. announced that it's in June, I, I believe. So we were supposed to have it last year, but got canceled for obvious reasons. And I think they're they're promoting a Forefront this coming June again in the Gaylord Convention Center in Denver, yeah. Colorado. Yeah, so I think that'll be interesting to see where that goes and how it transpires. And um, I've been uh, trying to stay active on LinkedIn, giving everyone like a little piece of information every other day or so on the capacity concerns that we've been running into. I find that, uh, you know, when we write these papers for SCTE, they're very long and in-depth, but we all like to take information in tidbits. You know, we're we're very, uh, our, our sense of, uh, what, what would you call it? It's like, I don't like to attention watch boxing spans. matches anymore. I'd rather see MMA. <laughs> Short attention spans. I'd rather see a conclusion quicker. So uh, I've been throwing out little tidbits uh, every other day or so on capacity concerns. And the last one was on VoIP. You and I talked about this on the podcast, you know, VoIP is becoming more and more, I think, prevalent. And it was going out of vogue. Now it's coming back in because people were using it out of their home, which actually brings up another point to, to Rob was, um, are you seeing, because you're in the battery business now as well with your, your mother company, if you will, uh, what about UPS for homes or are you seeing anything with battery backup for EMTAs or cable modems in the house, or you guys don't really go down that path? No, that's, that's not our focus. We're seeing an uptick from both telcos and broadband operators for uh, battery backup time. So that's one element um, that we're seeing, making sure the networks are, are stable for X amount of hours, depending on the, the location that, that those hours are varied, but not so much in the home. Yeah, that's kind of a different different animal. Okay. All right. Thanks. Rob, how about yourself? Anything uh, coming up? Anything you want to plug? Well, we're pretty excited about what's going to be coming soon with CBRS deployments and 5G. We talked a little bit about that a few minutes ago, but uh, um, just, I think there's going to be an explosion over the next few years of cable operators getting into the wireless business more and more. And that means uh, from the lens of, of uh, powering and backup and uh, backhaul, uh, we're pretty excited about that. what that means for us. We have a, a new generation of uh, power supply that's in trial right now that has some of that intelligence that we talked about earlier as far as utility monitoring and spectrum analysis. Uh, that's going to be, I think, useful and, and very beneficial in, in that space. Um, and uh, I just, I think it, we're kind of at a technology inflection point. It's something you maybe see once in your career um, where there's so much happening. Um, the whole Cable Apps 10G initiative, I think, is indicative of what we're going towards. And uh, there's just a, uh, we have a lot of excitement around what that's going to mean for for us from our perspective and and really personally what that's going to mean for all of us and the capabilities we'll have individually with our communication devices and our phones and tablets and things that the things we're going to be able to do a few years from now are are going to be amazing compared to where we've been yeah so i think you're i think you're spot on about that rob uh john and i covered this two weeks ago we, we talked about the apple event and the main new feature in Apple's phones was 5G, and I think they mentioned 5G close to 50 times in, in their, their live event. That is the feature if you're getting a new iPhone. Unfortunately, a lot of people aren't going to be able to take advantage of that, but it sounds like you guys, Rob, Enersys, is in a prime position to take advantage of that. You're talking about CBRS and then the migration to 5G where you can start plugging those 5G hotspots directly into your power supplies and enabling cable operators to do the same thing. So that's really, really exciting. So glad to hear, Rob, that you guys are in a pole position for that. Um, 
So, John, Rob, thanks so much for joining today. A very in- interesting conversation on power supplies. I definitely hope our listeners enjoyed it. If you guys did, please give us the thumbs up. Thanks, everyone, for uh, the chat room discussion. Jason, empl- enjoyed your dry sense of humor once again. Please keep it up. Uh, dead amp, dead amp. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scratching my head on that one, but Okay. All right, everyone. Thanks so long. And we'll be back in a couple weeks with more. Take care and so long. All right. Thanks. Thanks.